and welcome to Book Lust. I'm Nancy Pearl. My guest today at University Bookstore is prolific author and all around nice person, Martha Brokenbrow. Martha. Hello, Nancy. It's good to see you again. It's good to see you too. And I'm so excited to talk about your new book, which is a biography for young people about Alexander Hamilton. And before I ask you any questions, I just have to say, this is one of the most handsome books that, that I have ever seen. It is just beautifully, beautifully done. So tell me about the making of this book and how you and your editor worked to make this happen. I would love to tell you about that. First though, I have to undress the book for you because it's one oh. that even looks good without its jacket on, yes. um, you know, a little shiny gold. Um, so uh, my editor is, is uh, Jean Fywell. She is the uh, publisher at Macmillan. Um, her imprint is Fywell and Friends, and we've done other books together. Um, you wouldn't expect them to lead to Hamilton. The first book we did together was Finding Bigfoot and the second one was <laughs> Shark Week. We did those with the Discovery Channel and had such a great time working on nonfiction together. And when we started talking about doing something on Hamilton, we wanted to do stuff that hadn't been done before. So there has not been a young adult version of Hamilton. And also we knew that people who love the musical were going to want to have a beautiful object to kind of accompany those mm -hmm. songs because this is it, this has more than what the musical has. I mean, obviously there's more space in a big fat book. Um, and so part of making it a beautiful object was to, she hired a designer, his name's Raphael Gironi, and this was, uh, this is the cover as it was presented to me and I loved it instantly. And as part of my research, I used a lot of paintings and maps and you know old original photos. old uh, you know all those things that were available because they helped me imagine what New York was like what the West Indies were like even you know during a hurricane and so I told Jean that I had all this stuff and I made a Pinterest board and I sent it to her and then she found a way to make sure that much of it could be included in the book and I think you know, what it does is give people as much of an experience as possible. And when we think about learning things, and we think about nonfiction, we sometimes forget that you can learn from looking at pictures sometimes even better than you can from reading text. And so it was a labor of love for both of us. Um, mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm thrilled. I'm so glad you like it. Oh, yeah. I, I don't know if we can get, um, you know, close-ups of this, but the, the type changes, the size of the font changes, and the, 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 um, the color of the page in a way, and I know this was deliberate, or I suspect it was deliberate, it looks old fashioned. It looks like the kind of book that, and Alexander Hamilton was a great reader. Yes, from childhood on. From childhood on, and you talk in the book about that some of his prized possessions, or maybe his most prized possessions, were those books that he had. I would say those were absolutely his most prized possessions. So, you know, anyone who is familiar with the musical knows that, knows that he grew up poor. Um, he was not initially an orphan. Um, he had a collection, though, of 36 books because his parents weren't married to each other. Um, and this was the, the bastard part of right. Lin-Manuel Miranda's music. His parents weren't married, so he was not allowed to go to school with the other kids. He did have some private instructors, um, but very much of his early education, he was self-taught self -taught. with these 36 books, which was a lot of books for a young person or any person to have then. Um, after his father left the family, his mother died, and um, her, all of her belongings went to her son by her first husband, whom she had divorced. So this left Alexander and his brother with absolutely nothing. A kind uncle did buy back those 36 books, and you can see the influence in young Alexander's writing. He wrote romantic poetry in the yes. style of Alexander Pope. <laughs> yeah, and you include, you include, um, you talk about that, and uh, <laughs> I, I, I guess one of the things that you've done 
is humanize him in a way that I think you, you, you're, you're such a good writer and you're such a good writer for, for young adults and young people because it's like you're talking to them. You know, this is a very personal, per, you can almost hear you talking to the reader, but you don't talk down to them. I think anyone who talks down to young people has no idea how smart and capable young people are. Right. And, and I certainly haven't forgotten what it was like to be a young person, you know, very much the same way I am now, full of curiosity and intensity. Um, and young people deserve to have good history presented to them. Yes. When I was in high school, I used a textbook that bored me to tears. In fact, I, I, it was one that I got from my older brother and I handed down to my younger siblings, but they got the version <laughs> of it with my little margin comments and, and thought <laughs> bubbles. And you know, for me, history is made of people. History is made of people and their relationships with each other and then the choices that they make together. And so this is really as much the story of Alexander Hamilton and George Washington and Alexander Hamilton and Aaron Burr and, and Hamilton and his wife Eliza and you know all of these relationships that people had and to me that's what makes history come to life because then we realize I too have relationships with people and I too make choices and you know we are at this very moment making history with our choices and our relationships and um, so, you know Hamilton was no different from us um, except that you know he was a really tireless student and yeah. brave to recklessness on the battlefield. Um, but, you know, any one of us could be the next Alexander Hamilton. Do you believe that? I, in a lot of ways. I mean, yes, we do have a really specialized world, um, but Hamilton today would have been just as voracious of a reader. He would have published even more readily than he was able to publish. Mm -hmm. And you look at how people make big platforms for themselves. Um, I guess what struck me was his sense of honor. That I, I think that that's something that we don't think about. We don't necessarily associate that with our po the politicians, with the word politician. I think we definitely don't, although we certainly could. There are many honorable politicians, and I'm not of the camp that we write them all off. I mean, there are people right. who've taken bullets to the head and continue yes. to serve oh, the absolutely. nation. absolutely, absolutely. Um, honor does feel like an antiquated concept. We don't talk about it much anymore, but I also think that if you stop and say Alexander Hamilton was all about honor, that you've really missed um, the last step in the journey. And why was honor important to him? That was the question that I asked, mm -hmm. um, and, you know, because that is what propelled him to fight on the battlefield. That was what propelled him to get into a totally reasonable, if deadly, debate with Aaron mm -hmm. Burr. And it all goes back, I think, to his childhood and his early years. Here was someone who was essentially an outcast. His father didn't love the family enough to stay. His mother died. Um, yeah, he was he, nine, was he? Yeah, he was, he was 12. 12. But he, was, he was about 10 when his father left, uh -huh. 12 when his mother died, and yeah. he had been sick in bed yes. with her. The family had just the one bed, and she died next to him. Yeah. And what I think motivated Alexander Hamilton was a desire to be loved, and he didn't think that he would be worthy of love if he wasn't honorable. So it wasn't just that he wanted to be honorable, he wanted that most human thing to be loved. This necklace that I'm wearing actually has his handwriting and it says, all for love. It came from a letter that I stumbled across. I stumbled across just a, a, a transcription of the letter and I noticed that all for love had been capitalized and I wanted to see the actual letter itself. And so I tracked it down at the library where it's kept and I asked if they might scan it for me and they said, yes, for a fee we will. And so I paid the fee and I saw this letter. It was one that he had written to a girl who dumped him. This was before he got engaged. Um, anyway, this woman, she dumped him and 
broke his heart. He wrote her a four page, I call it a dignity reclaiming letter. <laughs> and the handwriting in this letter, I saw so much of his handwriting. I saw handwriting from when he was a 12 year old boy writing to his best friend saying, I wish there was a war. I saw handwriting that he had written during the revolution, which was tired and messy. But this handwriting on this four page reclaiming my dignity letter um, was neat and tiny <laughs> and perfect. And he wrote that he would be all right um, after this heartbreak because his motto was all for love. The last letter he wrote to his wife when he was facing the possibility that he might die in a duel said that he had to do it because if he didn't, he would be unworthy of her esteem. So that thread, that all for mm -hmm. love, that was why he wanted um, to have honor. Um, and that's the thing that I think people can still relate to today. Who doesn't want to right. be loved? Right. Well, where did your interest in Hamilton come from? I actually was really interested in the Founding Fathers starting when I was a young journalist. I was the editor of my college paper. My first year out of college, I taught a First Amendment class uh, at Lakeside School in Seattle. And so I started reading and studying the Constitution then, and you know, so much of what I believed in was what was included in the Constitution and expressed in the Bill of Rights. And at that time, I was more of a James Madison girl. Uh -huh. um, when the musical became popular, I was initially really skeptical. I'm just skeptical of anything that's popular. But then I listened to it. And I listened to it again, and I read the Chernow uh -huh. book, which is really a remarkable piece of, of work that showed us so much more about Hamilton. Because right. Hamilton had been kind of rejected as an elitist, and I can totally understand why. He did say some dumb and unfortunate things yeah. at small points in his career, but that wasn't the sum total of him. And anyway, when Jean came to me and said, how would you like to write the Hamilton book? I did not hesitate. I set everything aside because I knew there was an extraordinary story to tell in a way that had not yet been done. How much actual, did you do all your, some people that I've talked to who, who have written nonfiction, who are doing a lot of research, talk about how really a lot of it, so much of it can be done now sitting at home uh, via, you know, via the internet. Um, but when I was reading this, I, I kept wondering, did you go to Nevis? You know, <laughs> did you go to the West Indies? I mean, what? I wish, what, I wish I had gone there. Especially <laughs> during an awful rainy winter that we're in the midst of. Well, so I do have a lot of firsthand experience with awful rainy winters. Yes. I did wish to go to Nevis and there wasn't time. I had a pretty tight deadline. Did you? I mm. did, and I would have loved to have more time to work on the book, although I'm certainly delighted with how everything turned out. Um, but there was no time to go to Nevis. There was time to go to New York. Uh -huh. There was time to go to Washington, D.C. I wish there had been time also to go to Philadelphia, but I did get a sense for some of the vital places. Uh -huh. um, I did get a revolutionary era cannonball. It was my birthday present. <laughs> um, and, and I like to have these physical objects, and I like to be in places, and I like to see buildings and see statues and see paintings. Um, the Francis Tavern in uh -huh. New York was one of the places that I visited. It's still, you know, this was a place, it was a, um, during the Revolutionary War, the British hung out there before and after. It was a place for patriots. Uh -huh. And they have a museum upstairs that's amazing. But just to be in those spaces and see the tables and how they were set right. out, um, you can't, replace that when you're trying to capture it and bring things to life. And so I do think it's useful whenever possible for um, for people and to see, you know, to see his handwriting is better than seeing a transcription, even though the handwriting sometimes hard to hard read. To read. Yeah. Did you um, do a lot besides the Chernow book? Did you do a lot of reading and and how do, how do you do that? I mean, how do you do that when you're researching and using someone else's you're not at you know you're not at um, primary research. You're using secondary sources, and so what do you? How did you handle that? I like to get a really big picture mm -hmm. of someone's life, and you cannot get that from just reading one book. Right. I mean, you you know not not if you're going to be writing. You yes. could, certainly could as a right. reader. Right. Right. Um, and so I read a lot of biographies, and I read. Um, 
you know, other things like 1776, you know, to get a sense mm -hmm. of what was going on sure. during that pivotal year. And I, it, my goal was to first understand who are these people and what was this time like. Um, and then it was a matter of, of going over to the primary sources, of looking at those documents and looking at those records, um, of going to museums. The New York Public Library had a Hamilton exhibit that was really great and had, you know, the actual Malachi Postlethwaite books on economics wow. that um, that he toted around through, you know, throughout war. And they were huge. Um, and you know, so so once I had the big picture, then I could sort of fill in the details. And in seeing those details, I saw different things that other big picture biographers yes. had seen. Right. And so the whole idea that Alexander Hamilton was motivated because he wanted to be loved is something that I think is new and different mm -hmm. in my book. And other historians might disagree, but I think it's pretty clear in the textual record that mm -hmm. this man wanted to be loved. And this explains like. Why on earth would he have an affair with young Mariah Reynolds? She made him feel lovable. Mm -hmm. And yes, it was a huge mistake, um, but it was understandable through that lens. Right, right. And um, anyway, and I also, and I included that in the book, even yes. though it's for young readers, because I do think it's important for people to realize that leaders are human beings like the rest of us. They're capable of courage and they're capable of, of corruption. And it all depends on the choices that you make. It's not like anyone is predestined to be perfectly heroic all the time. It's right. always a choice. Right. And so, I, you know. And you make good choices and you make bad choices. You make good choices and, and you, you make bad ones and the bad one is laid out well. I mean, he yeah. tried to keep his wife away. He broke a promise to his son so that he could have unfettered access to his lover. And I, it disappoints all of us who love and admire him, but he's a human being and that does happen. So in that Jefferson Hamilton dichotomy, um, you're finding yourself squarely in the Hamilton camp. I am a hundred percent in the <laughs> Hamilton camp and it's Thomas Jefferson wrote a lot of interesting things. Um, he certainly you know had a major hand in the writing of the Declaration of Independence and those are words that we all love but we have to remember that that same document talks about Native Americans as merciless savages. Um, there was a real darkness to Thomas Jefferson. He had, um, I don't want to call it an affair, he forced one of his enslaved human beings into a sexual relationship. She was 14 when it started. They had many children together. He enslaved all of them. And so I don't think that a man who's given credit for um, the American ideals the way Thomas Jefferson has um, can be understood responsibly without knowing that in fact he made many arguments um, to try to prove the inferiority of black people, um, the inferiority of women. Um, Jefferson also tried to initiate an affair with Alexander Hamilton's married sister-in-law. All of this makes me think, wouldn't it be interesting to have a tabloid newspaper, the, 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 uh, the, the goings-on of the rich and famous <laughs> in, in colonial and revolutionary there, America? There were <laughs> such tabloids, and you know, Hamilton's affair was called out. He wrote letters, I mean, he, everyone knew what Thomas Jefferson was doing, but he was not publicly humiliated. And a lot of that has to do with, you know, what enemies you make. Right. And if you make an enemy with people who um, have ink by the barrel full, eventually that's going to come out. But there definitely were. Um, and for me, the question of an extramarital affair is a wildly different question than um, keeping your own children enslaved. Mm -hmm. And so I took no small pleasure in disclosing that Thomas Jefferson <laughs> suffered from chronic diarrhea. I like to think, and this is totally fictional, but I like to think that James Hemings, who was Sally Hemings' brother, and James Hemings was the um, half-brother of Thomas Jefferson's dead wife, enslaved. He was his chef who was classically trained in Paris. And I like to think that James Hemings was slipping something poisonous <laughs> into Thomas Jefferson's <laughs> meal um, to get a little bit of revenge. Wouldn't you? Wouldn't <laughs> that you? Was, that was uh, that, that, an, interesting, an interesting idea. But why, <laughs> d 
<laughs> I know, rein me in, rein me in, Nancy. <laughs> no, no, I, I think um, go for it, you know, the search for Bigfoot and, and you know, what caused Thomas Jefferson's stomach distress. <laughs> And it would be a tough time in, before there was indoor plumbing to have yeah. oh, yes. stomach distress. Oh, yes. I, I, Perhaps I, compassion I, 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 is called for. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> <laughs> but but you, you, cut, you, you give Alexander Hamilton um, uh, the space to be the, who he is and to acknowledge the, um, the different aspects of him. And, and, and with Thomas Jefferson, it's true that I didn't give him quite as much space, um, but this book really is written from Hamilton's point oh, of yeah. view. Oh yeah, no, no, and no, so, not even. Yeah. Sorry, not even just in the book, but in your in your thinking about. And maybe if I were to write a biography of Thomas right. Jefferson, I would find more space right. for that compassion and to right. give him the space. I just feel like um, his name is one that you can put out there and everybody kind of gets yes. down on their knees right. and, oh, Thomas Jefferson. Right. Um, and it's useful to know that um, he had he made some serious um, lapses in, in judgment and, and the hypocrisy is right. deep. I think it's useful because then we can consider our own hypocrisies in today's day and think, mm -hmm. how might history view that? And when history glosses it over, then you, one might hope that one's own hypocrisies are, are similarly airbrushed. And mm -hmm. I don't think that serves anyone because again, it comes down to choice. And we all have a choice not to be a complete wretch. Yeah, yes. Um, who else are you interested in? Any of the other founding founding fathers? I mean, I know you said Jane, you were a James Madison girl. I was, and I, you know, he's certainly an interesting man and was one of the most diligent students during um, the Constitutional Convention. His record of it is how we know what was said and what ideas didn't make the cut. I have to say, though, I'm very interested in Abigail Adams. Um, she and her husband exchanged some of the most vicious letters. They were absolute masters of insults. And unlike a lot of women who stayed out of politics, she was in the game. And you know what an interesting woman and what an interesting force. Mm -hmm. um, I, you know, there's generally not as good of documentation of the lives of women back right. then. But I do feel that women are. Uh, very deserving of thorough biographies, and especially for young readers. And I have to say, I'm getting tired of seeing books of, you know, here's 12 great women. Um, you never see books about 12 great men, but you'll see 12 great women or 12 great people of color. Right. And it's like, well, really, you know. Yeah, let's pull them out and see them as individuals. Exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah. So someday I'll write something about a spectacular woman. Yeah, you know, I mean, I when I was a kid, I read all those orange biographies, the Dictionary of Famous Americans. I think they were they were called. And Dolly Madison was one, and Abigail Adams was one, and Narcissa Whitman. I mean, that's how I was introduced to history, which I later, which I love, and which I ended up getting a master's degree in history because you know I that? loved it. So yeah, I, and I would have gone on for a doctorate, but I. I, I couldn't decide what period I was most interested in, whether it was early American, which I, I loved this period, or um, Greek and Roman, which I also loved, or medieval, which I was just so drawn to. So I just kept taking classes and taking classes and learning more. Oh, we like all the same things. Uh, yeah, yes, yeah. I, I, I'm just so fascinated by your your range of interests and your your ability to um, to get a book out on deadline and have it be such a beautiful piece of work where I, I've always believed even when I was a children's librarian and it, that if you wanted information if you wanted basic good information read a children's book because that gives you not just the facts, but it just sets it up for you. And then you can go on 
And I think that this Hamilton is, is really for young people. It's not for little, it's not a picture book. Um, there's a ton of material in here <clears throat> that anyone who's, who's the least bit interested has many paths that they can follow. And I just am so in awe of your, <laughs> of your ability to do that. Well, my kids did ask that I not do another book <laughs> quite so rapidly because it did, I mean, it meant a lot of time um, surrounded by stacks and stacks of books. Mm -hmm. And my 13-year-old Alice, I would have her go through, I, you know, I had this one book that was a collection of newspapers from that time, and I had her go through and mark every page with a sticky, you know, all the Hamilton pages because, mm -hmm. you know, it would save me time. Um, I, I love doing this. I love the world. Mm -hmm. I think it's so fascinating. I mean, everything from Bigfoot to sharks to writing novels to writing picture books, it's all, you know, different forms and different facets of the world right. to explore. And it's, the, I cannot imagine a better way to spend my life. And I feel really fortunate to get to do it. And you don't, we just have a little bit of time left, but so you don't, you don't have, um, writer's block or you don't give into it or how do you just deal with it? You know, there's no point in giving into it and I right. find myself, if I get stuck in a novel, it means that I've wandered down the wrong path. And so I'm not going to keep pushing down that path until another idea has occurred to me. Mm -hmm. And it means that the going is a little bit slow sometimes. But I can always write a picture book, which is a lot like writing a poem. Or I can just right. write a poem and have no intentions of, of having it go anywhere at all. And I think, um, you know, the well keeps flowing as long as you keep cranking on it. Just pump, yeah, pump, pump away. Pump that well. Um, and, you know, for me, it's a lot of, of joy. And having a deadline helps, too. Yes. You know, um, external pressure is good. And, and if you can give that to yourself when you're working on something, anything, yeah. by all means. And so your background as a journalist really comes into play, even with your fiction, because of, of knowing you have to write it, you have to get those words. You have to write it, and you can always edit it. Once right. you've gotten something down, then you right. can edit it, which is a lot easier than trying to get it all down perfectly. We don't have to do that. We are not dancers on stage. There right. is no one moment of performance, mm -hmm. and you know, stuff comes. I ended up cutting 20,000 words from wow. that book. It was, it was fatter, wow. and I sat on my aunt and uncle's couch in Minneapolis, and I cut 20,000 words, and I don't think the book lost anything, uh -huh. but you know, so, sometimes it takes longer to write short. Right. Gosh, Martha, thank you so much. Thank you so much for your book. Thank you so much for your previous books. Thank you for all that you do to make the world um, a better place for readers. Thank you, and thanks for all the same, Nancy. Yeah.